What's up, savages? Welcome to the Savage Syndicate Podcast, where I inspire the average person how to become hard to kill, physically, mentally, spiritually, financially. Each one of my guests is going to help you become hard to kill in one of those aspects. So sit back, enjoy, subscribe, share, and stay safe, stay savage, stay hard to kill. All right, savages, welcome to another Savage Syndicate podcast. Again, my main goal is to keep you guys hard to kill uh, physically, mentally, spiritually, and financially. I think my next guest here can check off every one of those boxes. Uh, Kevin Marin, thank you for coming on. You are the founder of Gutter Kings. Uh, you have a podcast of your own called Blue uh, Blue Collar Millionaire. Thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. How are you doing today? Good. Josh, thanks for coming on. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For those of you that don't follow me religiously, uh, I just did a 150 uh, pull-up challenge. Kevin, my man, is the one who did that. And and how I found it, um, I was uh, getting ready to go to jiu-jitsu. And I was scrolling through Facebook, and I saw that challenge, and my heart started racing. I thought, oh, man, am I going to be able to do it before 12? I didn't read the details. I didn't know I had... 31, 30 days to do it. I knocked it out. I couldn't sleep that night. I woke up at 5.30 and I knocked out 150. And uh, But thank you for that challenge. That was awesome. I love it. You know, Josh, everybody who did it, did it within three days. Really? Everybody. It's, it's the, it's the whole point, I made it. I, I knew the guys who were going to do it were going to do it right away. Yeah. You either can do it or you can't. Like I had some people message me and say, man, I don't think I could do that. But if I got the end of the month, I'll get it done. Yeah, that month went by and nothing happened. It was yeah. crickets. Well, it's kind of like we were just talking about before we hit record. It's instilled in me to be on time. It's instilled in me once you challenge, I may not be able to do it, but damn it, I'm going to do it right then and there and I'm going to give it my all. And that was kind of the attitude with that. Um, it was $1,000 to, to achieve 150 pull-ups. Um, and that's what I, that's what we're talking about. And yeah, it, it was awesome. I love those challenges. And, and it's not 150 at one time. It's 150, like in one sitting. So you could do 10, 10, 10, whatever. Yeah. And a lot of people, they're like, well, I could do that then, but they didn't Yeah, because it, it once you hit like, well, whatever, for some people you could hit 30 and, and it's, but some people hit, like I had a buddy, he, he said I, he hit 70 and he was doing one at a time. And he 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 told me he tapped out. He was like, "There's just no way I'm going to do another 80." Yeah. And that's what the whole point is. Like, can you get through this? There was one guy who did it, and he said he was doing one at a time from about 80 80 on. Yeah. But he he had told his his daughter. He said, "Hey, I'm going to do this this um, when you get home from school. We're going to take that thousand dollars. They were doing something with it together, some some soccer thing or whatever. And then now he's got motivation. What is he going to tell his twelve year old daughter? I didn't do him. Yeah, yeah. That's what he said. He said I would have quit if it was just internal. <laughs> well, that's a huge. But he says there's no me. way I was going to tell my daughter that I was going to say no to that. I, that's that's kind of the point of what I did it for. And then I met you. I met I met him. I met some other guys. I knew the guys." who did it, like, I'd want to know him mm-hmm. because I, I did make it 48 and over. Um, which I, which I, I checked off that box. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because I know anybody who's 48, like you can't just decide to do 150 pull-ups. It's not going to happen. You were already, do- anybody who did it was already doing a lot of stuff. <clears throat> yeah. I actually did them this morning. I was thinking about it again. Cause I just have that. <laughs> My wife got it from one of those infomercials where you just put it in the doorway and you do them. Yes. Um, and I've had that for years and I just, you know, whether it's five, 10, 20, whatever the knockout, I just try to do them consistently. Cause you know, like, like when you told me that guy was only doing one to 70 and then he quit at 70 and he should like, to me, my mental thing is like, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You can't look at that whole elephant. You could have did it. Yep. Yeah. And be like, holy shit, I got to do 150. Cause that's what I did. I broke it up. I started out, I think I did 10 and then it started breaking down into fives because I have injuries. I'm 48. Shit happens. And it's yeah. like, I'm not, I'll, 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 I'll do it. I'll do half of one if I have to, just to get up to the full one. I'm not giving up. And that's what I think the mentality has to be is like, you just keep pushing. I love the, the, the battle with your own mind. So 
for the pull-ups, I don't have that anymore. But say I used to do sprints and I used to do 12, 100 yard sprints before I got asthma like 10 years ago. And when you, I don't care how many times you do it because you have to truly sprint, right? Mm -hmm. And when you get to like your fifth or sixth sprint and you're walking back, you start making, man, maybe I'm going to, man, my hamstring, I don't want to hurt. I don't want to make this worse. I would do it every time where I'd be trying to talk myself out of it. 12 is a lot of sprints. Yeah. And I liked, like, I would always tell myself, like, don't be a bitch. Like, that's how I talk to myself. I'd walk back like, all right, hold up, go get in the car and do the walk of shame and you're done. Like, there's no way I'm going to do it. So I do the same thing with pull-ups. I yeah. have a buddy. I always say, sometimes after I do a workout, I say, go do a hundred pull-ups or, or be a bitch and go upstairs. And I just can't. <laughs> People think I'm, you're crazy. I'm, I'm you're from like the old school. Like that's how that's how we used to talk to our friends, and that's just like in my house, nobody was calling me a bitch. But yeah, yeah. We, there was no quitting or anything. There was no quitting. Yeah, I do the same thing. It's amazing how strong your mind is because you can go in there. Your mind will quit way before your body does. So when I'm in there, sometimes at the gym, and I'm like, oh, you know, oh, I got to go do this. I got to do that. And if I'm in in the middle of a rep or set, and I'm like, oh, I'm done. And then I have that inner bitch or that inner voice too going, oh, you mother, you yeah. just doubt you play. Okay, I got to go. I'm always having these battles. My wife thinks I'm crazy because sometimes I share them with her and she's like, you need to see somebody for that. I'm like, no, it's just. I know. <laughs> it, it, it drives people nuts when you tell them about it. The other thing I, well, the only thing I do now that I'm older is if I do truly feel like I have an injury or I'm, I'm going to make it worse, that's just stupid to keep going. So. Then I'll just say, like, if my shoulder's hurting, I'm like, what's the point of the next 10 minutes? Then I'll just go get on the elliptical or walk. I'll do something else. But when I was young, I would have been like, I, I was like, nah, I'm not doing it anyway. Steve, that's my argument now is because I'm the same way. Like, I I did a, another challenge with a thousand pull, um, push-ups. And I had a jiu-jitsu tournament coming up that weekend. And so I posted, yeah. like, yeah, I've never, you know, I had shoulder surgery. I've had all these surgeries. And I don't really do push-ups a lot before that. Um, and then I just knocked him out and I, my, my black belt instructor is like, what are you doing? I'm like, Oh, I just, somebody challenged me. I had to do it. He goes, you have a competition, dude. Like how you're going to be sore. Yeah. Like I was sore, like I was crazy sore, but it's like, I'm not the brightest guy. If there's like, I should have thought, Hey, maybe I'll pull this off until after the jujitsu tournament. But I, I'm just like, you challenge, like literally you challenged me to do something. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to die trying, but I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm 48 and I'm still having those battles of like, I shouldn't have done that. I probably shouldn't have even done the pull-up one because of my, I had surgery on my arm, but I'm like, you know what? I'll do with this. I'll deal with the pain later. Right. Like who, who said it pain to, or uh, roadhouse pain. Don't hurt. I don't let pain hurt or something to stupid like that. And I'm always <laughs> I love like, the movie. Yeah. I know oh, the line in the movie. And then I go to surgery and my wife's like, yeah, how'd that go for you, Josh? How, you didn't want to tap. You didn't want to do this. And now I look at you. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but well there, there's yeah. a perfect example the analogy of jujitsu uh tapping it, not tapping is crazy yeah you know like if you're in, even if you're in a in a fight in a ufc fight and you you got to tap because you need to just c come back otherwise you a whole year you, you may never be the same you remember when uh frank mir broke uh you forget who is whose arm he he never really was the same after that. He broke his shoulder. Yeah. Well, he wasn't oh, tapping. Yeah, big nog. Ooh, that was a brutal one. Yeah. yeah. He had that Kimura and it, and it snapped off. Yeah. Uh, which is ironic because I do tap a lot in jiu-jitsu. And it, it's weird. It's Close okay to. in jiu-jitsu for me to tap and not be hard on myself. Um, I do yeah. really hard and like to sometimes extent of like that probably should have done. But and then I walk in like, you know, you knuckle up, you high five the guy and you go right back at it. But Maybe that's the only time I give myself a break is because I, I roll with some killers and yeah. I'd be dead if I didn't do it. In well. jujitsu, it's great. The community, it's so acceptable. But, you know, you you sparring or anything. When I grew up and I used to box with my friends in the basement, there was no there was no chance anybody was going to say I had enough. No mas. Yeah. Yeah. You would just get if you were if somebody was better than you, you'd just be getting lit up is what would yeah. happen. I think that's the generation, like, that's why our mentality is the way it is. If like we now, I'm trying to make my 10 year old son think the way I think, but now yeah. I see some people like he's in flag football and they're soft. Like I blame the parents, like they're a kid's catching a ball. Like he, it's like, it's going to hurt him and he's batting away. And, and I, I don't know. My son is super athletic because I'm out there with him. I'm throwing the football. I'm surfing with them. We're doing jujitsu. And when these kids can't catch a football or can't even run a route, I don't make fun of the kid. It's not the kid's fault. It's the, I look at the parents. I'm like, what are you doing with this kid that 
one, he's overweight. Two, he's scared of a football. Like, what are you doing? You're not, you're failing. Like, I, I, I it drives me nuts. Uh, I'm so with it. I, my my son's four, and I, I have that talk with him like twice a week, where I'm like, where he's whiny and crying. I'm trying to get him off that because yeah. it's. I just tell him that's not how we do it. And my brother lives here too, and he's even more than me on that. And we both get on him. He's there's he's. It's just not going to be acceptable for him. And it's not like. I just think it's a big advantage if you have that mentality, especially with these kids that are soft now in sports, you could run over them. When yeah. I when I was playing sports in the in the 80s, all the kids were like that mostly. Yeah. We, we I mean, you look at football now, it's it's really soft. Back then, I mean, we were basically encouraged to spear people and throw our helmet into their chest. Oh, yeah. yeah. I remember and it, it didn't matter. I remember lining up and the coach would come up with his helmet and just bang our heads with the helmet. Because he didn't like something we do. Now yeah. that guy would probably go to jail for doing that. And we all yeah, he would. Our ears oh, getting yelled at. And... Else. Yeah, but yeah, but my... it, go ahead. it te- yeah, it teaches you getting yelled. It's not that like coaches should be screaming at kids, but like yeah, you gotta like take some hits in life, and you yeah. can get past it. One of the best things that happened with me is I had a a crazy neighbor when I had a landscaping business when I was 15 years old and he was like screaming at me all the time. I had to learn how to deal with this crazy guy. I remember I told my mom, this guy's crazy. And my mom said, well, you can either decide not to do his lawn or you can go talk to him and tell him like a man what you want. Like she said that. And I remember telling him, uh, he was like yelling at me all the time. And like, he's like, do you even want this? I said, I don't, I don't need it. You know? And like, it's good experiences. 15 year old now would probably hide under the covers and his mom would go over there. Yeah. My mom was like, no, nah, you got to do it yourself. Yeah. My, I picked up my son from school yesterday and he said, I, I always ask him, not how do you do in math? What I said, how many touchdowns you score? Cause he plays touchdown at lunch. And he goes, dad, this kid got hit with the ball in the face at dodgeball. And he went home for the rest of the day. And I, and I said, well, what did you think about it? He goes, I was like, why are you going home? You just got hit in the head with a ball. Like he, like he, he said, man up or something like that. I'm like, that's yeah. my boy. Like that's, I understand. Like, take a moment, you know, kind of if you cry, cry it off or whatever. But he said, Dad, he went home. I'm like, well, don't think that if you get hit in the head, you're going to come home. I'm not coming to get you. There's different yeah, parents ways. now are, are are so soft on their kids and everything. And, and you know, uh, sometimes I'd probably give too much to my son. I'm, I was spoiling, but you're not helping anyone by doing that. It's, yeah. The other thing is just there's so many men walking around who you know this more than anyone they can't they can't protect themselves let alone their family yeah they they have this idea of like oh when it happens i'll turn red or some nonsense like bro, you're not going to do anything yeah you see it all over youtube you see people it's crazy to me i saw a football fight and this guy wasn't defending himself and this guy was teeing off on him in front of his wife like 20 shots that like what what are you doing he wasn't even he was just like cowering that to me, like I get chills here in that story because that's it's mind boggling to me. Like I have I, the reason, multiple reasons. But one of the things I, I heard when I was starting Savage Syndicate was that somebody wouldn't go out because they had it, it was one of our friends son. Um, he had a good looking uh, girlfriend and during COVID. It wasn't a big deal because the bars were closed, but they turned 21 during COVID. And then she said, my son doesn't want to go out to bars because he's scared that if the girlfriend gets hit on, he won't know what to do. And I was like, oh, man, give me that kid for a while. Let me train him. But it's like, I know ever want to live in fear. I don't ever want to change my lifestyle because, oh, I can't go here because I'm scared if this happens. Right. I'm not going to Compton and and being the knucklehead, but I'm not going. I don't want to like go to a if I got football game and somebody yells at me, you know, I'm you know, it's I don't know, like seeing that guy or fit visualizing that guy cowering up and just getting. Uh, And what is that going to do to the guy beating him? He's not going to be like, oh. Oh, you're not going to fight back? He's going to keep pounding you. It might get worse. He was pounding him. Yeah. I mean, I, the people the wife was himself. trying to protect him. It was so hard to watch. That's sad. It makes me sad that there's people like, and being, you know, if, if, if I don't know, if something's broke, you fix it, right? That's a huge, that should be a wake up call to that guy that says, hey, that happened on this yep. day. Never again. I'm now going to go to Jiu Jitsu, Muay Thai. I'm going to make it, be proactive and, and figure out how to never have that happen again. I, I would totally respect that. Some guy that happened to him, and then he said, "All right, I can never allow this to happen again." And the truth is, if he started going to jujitsu and stuff, it it wouldn't happen to him again. Because most people, if you have even a basic level, if you're like a blue belt, you could be just ch- choke people out on the street. Most people, 
Yeah. And that's, that's, that's there's, not that hard. There's a guy I follow, Tom DeBloss. Uh, he's out of Jersey. I yeah. um, he started a thing. I, I might not be calling this right, but like bullies to heroes or something. He takes buddies, buddies to bullies or bullies to buddies or something. But he takes these violent videos that are going viral of, of people getting picked on. It could be adults. It could be kids. Mostly it's kids. But he says, get me a hold of that person. And through his network and all his jiu-jitsu connections, he usually gets a hold of these kids. And he takes them, whether they, they might be in Florida or somewhere, but they're an affiliate. And they take them under and give them free training for however long they want. Yeah. And, he, and, then, and then he checks in on these kids. Sometimes he trains them himself, but he checks in on these kids. They have more confidence. They know what they're doing. They're, they're talking. They're like the, the change, once they got that training, is huge and in, in, in adults too i mean you, i've talked about it before the confidence once somebody knows how to protect themselves is is undeniable i love that that he's doing that i know gracie does that as well he puts videos up and then the community finds people finds where that person is and he brings them in because if you got beaten up savagely and you don't do anything and you just internalize it yeah i would think you're walking around pretty scared all the time yeah that it's not going to happen again and unfortunately, look what happens when you bottle that up and you like these kids, they go out and they do these shootings and they're just like, I was watching something. Oh, me and my, or we were watching Stranger Things and we're, I, we're way behind, but it said um, we had to postpone this because due to a Texas shooting, right? I'm assuming it's that one where the guy pulled off the street and went in there. But uh, you see what happens, like she's getting bullied. Repetitive. It's not just one time, two times. It's like the whole semester or whatever. And then they snap and it's like, if you could have got that kid way before that, right. And, and helped him. And like, I always tell my son Kingston, I said, if you see anybody getting bullied, right. Go in there and, and, and protect that kid because you have like Liam Neeson, Liam Neeson, particular set of skills that allow that you to protect that kid. You might take a couple of hits or whatever, but nine times out of 10, you're going to, he's 10. You're going to know more than that bully. Right. And if you confront that bully, then they're going to know, Hey, Kingston's one, not the one to mess with. And also now you're protecting these kids and it's better. I always tell him to use his, his skills for good, not evil. We joke about it, but it's like, we, you know, I teach him how to fight. He's been fighting for a long time and we're very strict about bullies. And like, if he ever, you know, shows any aggression towards another kid because he can do some stuff, he loses it all. He loses jujitsu. He loses surfing. He loses everything that he likes to do because, oh, bullies. <laughs> drive me nuts i think the worst. grown men too grown people I and mean, women yeah. no matter who you are if you're a bully you're the lowest on my totem pole you, you know the truth is I, I i never had a job in my life except for two years in uh 2008 and uh i i worked at this place and i watched adults bully other adults it was crazy to me yeah it, they would cap like and i thought to myself you know Kids who are bullies become adults who get bullied. It doesn't stop just because you get out of high school. I saw it. I, I was like, this is crazy. Yeah. Tell, you know, kind of telling, telling, basically throwing people under the bus and people would accept that. So I don't know. Some woman tried that shit on me. And I was like, I told her, no, nah, that ain't going to work. Yeah. But it's the same thing. I was 30 something years old. It was crazy to me. They just tried it. They, they tried on people. So it's a different type of bullying. It's not physical, but, uh, Definitely adults are getting bullied at jobs. I, I mean, I saw it in my own company. I used to get guys, um, when they did certain things, I'd get them certain headphones that had you could listen to music in and stuff. And I saw one guy got it taken like two times. Like, you were literally taking, he was really small and he was allowing other people, like, was the guy taking him off his head? No, but he was putting them on and then saying, hey, is this guy going to really take them from me? Yeah. Wow. And I, yeah, I had to step in. It was crazy to me. I'm like, I told this guy, man, you can't just let somebody take your headphones. <clears throat> it's like prison rules. You got to stand up for yourself. Yeah, gutter king prison rules. <laughs> well, let's segue <laughs> into gutter kings because we could talk about this all the time. I uh, uh, tell us a little bit about gutter kings. And like you said, you you had a, the last W two job. I think it was in 2007, 2008. Well, tell walk us back there. Well, I never, I, I, I started, uh, I'm 51 years old. I started in 1991 as an entrepreneur right out of high school. And the only reason I even had that job was because in 2007, I had, I was overexposed on real estate and I got myself in trouble. So I basically had to rebuild for a year and a half, but I, I went right back to growing gutter Kings. Gutter Kings is a pretty simple business. We clean gutters on apartment complexes and condo associations. And, and we do it in a little more than half the country now. 
So it's, it's pretty big. It's a great business. It's simple. I like keep it simple, stupid businesses. It's, yeah. uh, there's not much to it and it's residual. So you're, I'm cleaning the same complexes over and over two times a year. And it's, it's just been great. Um, and that's, I, I, I just keep growing it. And, uh, that's why I do this blue collar millionaire. Cause I just try to show other guys, Hey, you, like making a hundred grand, isn't like a lot of money. Like, even though you're a blue collar guy, clean gutters, whatever, like you can, you can make millions of dollars, millions of dollars and, and change your entire family's life. So that's kind of why I do this community as well. Well, tell us about the the community. Like I know you have like a mastermind, right? It's, it's, a yeah. So just really, I had a lot of blue, I'm really a white collar guy who does blue collar work. That's how I always thought of myself. And that was an advantage. So a lot of blue collar guys, I knew them and I used to hang out with them, their buddies. And they would ask me, how do you do that? Or ask me about marketing and everything. And I would tell them, and then I, I used to think I need to do this like on a bigger platform. So I saw people doing Facebook groups. I started doing mine. This is, this kind of really took off. And yeah, so we have a, a Facebook group and I, me and my partner, Chris Garrison, we give like free advice and, and different things that have made us money so people can implement them and, and do them faster. But then we have a, a paid group, a monthly group, um, and guys come every Thursday and we teach lessons like that, that have really worked for us so they can implement them in their business. And then we have a, master, a mastermind. We're going to have another one in February. And that's like an on-site where, you know, like in a beach house private it's real cool private chefs everything and we're just teaching all those things in person and networking so yeah. I, I really like the community it's a lot of fun and how long have you been doing that the blue collar millionaire group i i started it almost two years ago and uh and and, and it's really just taken taken off in the last year like it because it's kind of niche and everything and i had a couple thousand people but now i think we we put on about 300 people a day right now it's going it's going really fast wow that's awesome uh, so I, I talked to you a little bit before this, um, uh, I usually do a lot of bullet points and talking points that I want to talk to people. Um, I highly suggest you follow Kevin on his social media, on his Facebook, because what I'm about to ask him is, is on there. This is one of his posts. And so I, during the research, I was like, I'm just going to go through this because 10 things that completely changed my business and life over the last 10 years, um, we'll just go one through 10 and I'll just, just talk briefly about a little bit right. about each one. Uh, the number one, borrowed belief, hanging out with people, doing big things that what that are doing what I want to do. So talk a little about that. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the mastermind thing. And, and I'm in masterminds. And when I and I got mentors that were doing so much more than I was. So I basically just learned everything on my own. Basically, the, my friends either had W-2s and didn't give a shit about my business or anything. They just didn't think like that. Or I hung around with business owners. I just generally who were doing less in sales. So maybe I thought it's kind of like Mark Evans says, the king of the dipshits. I mean, you, if you're doing this, you, you're not really going to learn much from them. So I, I started getting around. Here's one perfect example. I came in Atlanta in 2014. I, I was doing well. I was making, I don't know what's well, maybe I was making half a million dollars a year for myself. And I, I met this guy who was making about $7 million a year. And I was showing him he was helping me with my business and we were going over and he, he just was like, man, you should be making like $3 million a year on this. This is, this is, he, and he was kind of showing me the route. And at first I was like, the hell is this guy talking about making $3 million a year? And I don't know, just like hanging out with him, you started like he was really doing it. Plus he had a much better lifestyle. I mean, he was 20 years older than me, but he had this lifestyle. He was very relaxed. I was looking at my phone and texting people and employees and everything. And he was like, yeah, you got to, it's less is more. You got to get better people around you. And he just started breaking things down for me. So I got that borrowed belief from him. Mm -hmm. And I was like, cause at some point he was a smart guy, but I'm like, if he's doing like seven, yeah, I should be doing like one or two. Yeah. You know, I'm not talking about gross. I'm talking about net in your in your pocket. So it just really changed everything. And then I started getting in these masterminds and it doesn't have to be the same business as you. They could be doing something else. I got borrowed belief for blue collar millionaire from other people who had built really successful Facebook groups. I was hanging out with them. I became friends with them in those things. I started asking questions. They said, Hey, make sure you do this. This is one thing I wouldn't do. All of a sudden I started like, well, i it's just inevitable to me. I was like, yeah, this will work. So borrowed belief is huge. 
Yeah, I like that. And I got it from Mark as well. If, if you're hanging out with five dipshits, guess what? You're the sixth one. <laughs> yep. Oh, I love that one. Uh, this one, and I could uh, actually have some questions about it, but virtual assistance, game changer, a no brainer for any company, win, win. Yeah, I have a ton of virtual assistants. I don't know, I think about 27 now in different businesses. Um, for my main business, I have about 16 or 17 of them. When I mean virtual assistant, it, I mean, it could be somebody in the States who doesn't live with you. Mine happened to be almost all exclusively from the Philippines. But I've just met great people there. They work very hard. They're very honest. And it that mentality what happens is once you get one like an executive assistant and you start getting rid of stuff that's what's called below your pay grade like you got to focus on revenue producing things i knew what made me the most money just like i can't be up on buildings cleaning gutters and basically making 25 dollars an hour you got to create systems to get other people to do it so i understood that so i started i i found out about virtual assistants like for a long time ago i was probably one of the early people um 12, 15 years ago. And I just started hiring them. And then I, I got really good at teaching them by showing them with videos. I used to make YouTube videos of my own screen and write up the text and show them, hey, this is how I do it. And you do this. And a lot of times they do it better than you because that's, they're more, I'm not super organized. And in one in particular, she was just doing a lot of stuff better than me. And she got energy from that where it was draining to me. So I just started uh, do it. And that's really how I scaled my business so fast because I have this team of people, they're going 24 seven. And every time I have an idea or I have a process, I just hand it off. It's not like, oh, my, well, I'm already working 10 hours a day. Now I got to do this for two hours extra. I just hand it off. Yeah. Where do you it's all happening right now. They're answering emails, phone calls, everything. And I'm talking to you. Yeah. Where do you find your VAs? I find them on Upwork. Um, Actually, a friend of mine is creating a company now. I'm, I'm kind of helping it, getting involved with that because we there's such a need for it. But I find them on Upwork.com. Um, anybody who's interested in that, message me about that. I can. I have a whole uh, webinar on how I do it. Like I gave it step by step in like 50 minutes. I'll send that to anybody who wants to do it. I'll take that. It's it's, I, it's a game changer. Yeah, I'll send it to you. John. It's a game changer. Okay, great. Because I just hired a, a VA a couple weeks ago. And it's not her. She's doing awesome. But my my Twilio is not sinking. And I got a I get a whole other issue. I, I might talk to you afterwards about it. But yeah, she's doing great so far. Um, yeah, I will find a v I find VAs to fix those issues, too. Like I go on Upwork. I'll have one of my VAs. I'll say, hey, what's the issue? She said, oh, our CRM. And then I said, go find somebody on Upwork and interview them. And if it's good, let them do it. I don't have time for it. Yeah, like, I, I just don't, I don't want problems like that. I just you say, well, that's cost a lot of money. It really doesn't. Yeah, it costs you more money to do it yourself to me. That's what I'm finding is like yesterday I, I had a you know my to do list every day. And I'm like, just it starts out. It looks like a, on paper, a five minute job. And it turns into an hour. I'm like, I could have always could have passed that off. I could just like you said, make a video like, hey, this is what I'm expecting to do. And then have them done. I think that's the way I'm going to start doing. That. I got to talk to you about offline about that. We're. Yeah, yeah. I, I love like Loom videos. Like I saw some some things I didn't like this morning about a process we're doing with subcontractors. So I made a 10 minute Loom video. I, I walked through emails and I said, let's do this, this and this. I don't even write it up. Then my my, my executive assistant's going to write it up with bulletins and the team's going to watch it. And those are the tweaks we're going to make. Like, so it cost me 10 minutes and I'm out. Yeah. But I know that they're, they'll make it happen because they're great. They're great. And they're a good team. Awesome. Uh, number three, The One Thing by Gary Keller. This book got me focused on what matters in business. This That book was key to me. I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs, we have shiny new object syndrome. We, we are, we're not focused. We got ADHD. Like I got all those things too. And I, I read that book and it's basically saying like, what's the one thing you can focus on that if you do that one thing, and, it, and you make it happen, it makes a lot of other things like redundant or you don't even need to do them. A lot of times people, and I did this too, sometimes you want to do easy stuff like answer emails or you want to, you don't want to do like, you know, these are the two problems. So 
I would just, I started saying, all right, what are my things I really need to focus on? And then I would just zero in on those things. I would be like a, like a dog on a bone. Like I'm all in on this and you have to be okay with like some other things not getting done in your life. It's almost like the, tw- the 80, 20 rule, like 20, 80% of your customers come from uh, 20% of your effort. Like that's how I look at it. Like I want to get focused on the one thing that matters and I go all in on that. And it's not your logo and your and answering emails and, and, and all this other shit. And, and oh, I got to post on social media. Like what's the one thing to do it. That might be finding somebody who can do those things for you or creating systems. So someone else can do it or whatever it is. Or if you haven't paid your taxes, like you're putting it off. Like that's the one thing, get that one done before you get in big trouble. Yeah. Like, so I just started knocking these things off and I don't know that book. It spoke to me. He has a, a audio version of it. Anybody could listen to that. I just think it's great. So many people I've recommended to it and they're like, man, I love that book. And he's a, a, a super successful guy. He owns Keller Williams realty. Okay. What's up savages. Thank you guys for watching or listening to the Savage Syndicate podcast. I appreciate it. I want to take a quick minute to talk to you guys about the Savage Syndicate group I created. I created the Savage Syndicate group with one goal in mind, inspiring you guys on how to become hard to kill, how to become hard to kill physically, mentally, spiritually, and financially. Inside the Savage Syndicate group, you will have videos, 160 videos inside of a library, teaching you the fundamentals of striking, groundwork, situational awareness, tutorials on gas station safety, uh, restaurant safety, large groups, multiple attackers, All of that is inside this uh, library that I created for you. I also have my own personal workouts that I do every morning, all under 30 minutes. They're inside of here. I also have live Zoom calls, uh, either hosting with myself or I have guests on who are professionals at becoming hard to kill. Whether it's physical, mental, spiritual, or financial, all of these are experts here and geared towards making you hard to kill. So go to www dot savage syndicate group dot com sign up see you on the inside stay safe stay savage stay hard to kill uh we touched on this a little bit but masterminds getting around high level thinkers and doers and building long-term relationships with them yeah i i'm such a big believer of it and i'm in the deal maker family mark evans's group I, i've become really good friends with lots of guys in that group uh, and deal maker alliance And I just want to be around with people who are motivated. But here's one thing that really worked for me because I got it when I first got into masterminds that are paid. I'll tell you why I like paid masterminds, because I know everybody in that building or in that group or on that call is committed on on a pretty good level. They're paying money. That's different than going to a real estate networking group that like. That's nothing wrong with that, but a lot of those guys are just look, trying to find people who might have money. And it seems like they're all kind of doing, they're kind of all hustling and trying to go. There's nothing wrong with that. But I really want to go with people who, who've who already gotten to a certain point where, they've, where they where they know a mastermind is a good thing and they they show up, they're motivated, they've paid money. And I've become friends with these guys. It's just so easy to connect with them. And then they're, when you meet people through them, they're also high level people, right? Whereas if you have kind of a, a friend who, let's call him a train wreck, like he's got, like he always got a bag of problems. You know, these people, every time you're around them, some shit happens to you. Whoever they also in their network, whoever they introduce you to is probably something similar. Yeah. I know this from experience. I want to be around guys like Mark. When I talk to Mark and I, every time I meet somebody through Mark, he's like, I like him. I'm like, yeah, I want this guy in my life. He's a good family person. He's like, it's almost like Mark vetted him. And then I get to benefit just from it. Yeah. benefit from it. Yeah. That's so that's I- masterminds a thing. You get the borrowed belief. You get all these things. You can you can talk to people about your business and they've been there. So that's why I try to do that blue collar mastermind. I'm like, if I'm a 30 year old guy and I got a business and I'm doing $500,000 a year for me, if I, when I was that guy, if I could talk to the, to the 51 year old version of myself and hang out at a, you know, a few times a year and I can call this guy on the phone, like how I would, I would have got there much faster. No question. Yeah. You, you can't you, ask, you can't ask your buddy that he doesn't know the answer yeah. if he's not, if he hasn't done it. 
unless your buddy's Mark Evans or something like that, right? But an analogy to jiu-jitsu, you wanna if you want to learn uh jujitsu, you wanna hang out with if you hang out with 12 black belts and you roll around with those guys, yeah, you're gonna get choked out a lot. You you're gonna get good. If you hang out with 10 guys who talk about street fights they were never in, you're not gonna get good at fighting. Yeah. That's that's exactly what I, I how I look at it. I want to hang out with a bunch of black belts. It's like the saying, if you're the best in business. one in the room, if the best one in the room, you're in the wrong room. So that that's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Like I go in and get my ass kicked all the time. And it's the only place that I go in there going, man, I just got worked. Like, right. And then I walk out of there going, man, I learned a lot of shit though. I learned what not to do. I learned this works. I learned that doesn't work. And yeah. 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 Good analogy. Um Books. I know you talked about Gary, Gary Keller one, but books, reading the correct books, the right time in your life. There's no right book. There are the books you need at that time of your life. Yeah. I just, a lot of people say, what book should I read? Whatever. I need to know something about that. I love reading books. I've been reading books for 30 years, like all the time, every day I'm reading. I love it. It's been a huge thing. But when I, some of the books I read that were great 20 years ago, they, they don't, it's nothing for him. It's a great book, but it doesn't do anything for me now. Yeah. So it's like, you have to find what you need at that time. So that's why I'm always searching for that. And it's hard to explain that, but there is no run. You just have to find the book that you need at that time. That could be a mindset book. That could be a, uh, a business, a book on how to develop a business plan. But for somebody who already has one, it's, you need something different, higher level. So, um, if as long as people are always looking to find new books and everything, I just think that's the the most the biggest return on money you can ever have. A book is like nine dollars on Kindle, yeah. and basically that person, if you get a good one, they basically just tell you everything that they did that worked, and you could just pick and choose stuff. It, uh, it's I I don't understand why people don't do it, especially with audio books. You could just learn, do listen on your on in your car on the walk everything. I just want more info. I just want more cheat sheets. I want I want another uh, the uh, jujitsu analogy again. Like if you already feel like you're a black belt, you just want to get like better and sharper. And I just want like any info I can get. Yeah. This is how I think. Well, I think another. I don't know if it was from Mark, but somebody said, "Go back on your year and look at the inventory, the books you read, the podcast you listened to, all the things that you were absorbing." That'll tell you basically how your year went. Did, did you, were you excelling in your business? Were you excelling in jujitsu? And that's, I've always taken, like Mark drops so many nuggets, whether it's from him or the network or everybody. Yeah. It's like, I always stick with that. And so going to your, your thing that you said earlier about the shiny object, I'm a big reader too. I'm a big old school. I, I want the book. I want to turn pages and I love just sitting down and reading. My wife makes fun of me for that. She's an audio person, <laughs> um, but I'm reading two books now. One that Mark re referred and another one. So I don't try to, I don't usually do this, but I have two books going on. Do you do that? Or do you, do you like finish one and, and then go to the next one? Or what? what's your uh, uh, strategy? I generally fin finish one, but I, I always have a lot of times I don't finish them because if I, I don't feel like I need to finish it. if I'm if I'm 20, I read fast. If I'm 20% in and I'm saying I'm not really getting much out of this, I'll just move to another one. But yeah, I don't generally go back and forth. I like one thing. I that like to just finish like yeah, I've I've started to do that where I haven't finished and it still drives me nuts. It's always in the back of my mind that I, you know, because that book may come up somewhere along. I'm like, I didn't finish it. And it drives me nuts. So I, I try to yeah. finish but even if I'm not liking it, there's a lot of books that I read that I'm like, I'm not I did, but I gotta finish it. But yeah, so I'm I'm with I used you so to much. do I used to do that, but I think I, I just read so many that if I feel like this author's not it's not that their books are valuable, it's just not valuable for me now. I just move on. Well, what I've also noticed- The more you read, the more that's going to happen. Yeah. Well, the more, the older I'm getting, I'm kind of skipping a yeah. little bit. I'm like, this isn't really exactly. relevant. Exactly. So I'll jump forward to something that is relevant or that can help me. And my younger self would never do that. I'd be like, I'd have to read one to a thousand, like I'd, I'd have to finish it now. Hopefully I'm more wiser now. I'm like, oh, let me go to a chapter that is more relevant and can help me out more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, addition by subtraction, getting rid of negative thoughts, people, and habits. Yeah, that was kind of addition by subtraction is, you know, the obvious one. So getting rid of people in your life that they can be good people and you can like them. They're just not where you're going or they're doing stuff you don't want to do. Like I used to, uh, um, I used to drink 
and I would I would like binge drink a couple times a week. And I had like a group who binge drinked with me. And I remember thinking, because most people binge drinking aren't very motivated. So I was kind of an oxymoron. I was super motivated. I would still get up the next morning, but I would do that. And I remember I didn't I wanted to just stop drinking. And I was thinking, like, why would I would I if I was drinking a diet coke and I was hanging out with these two guys, would I ever do that? That's what I was thinking to myself. So when I stopped drinking five years ago, I never drank since. Uh I, I just never hung out with those guys. They're nice guys. They can text me and anything like this. I just, I just, I'm somewhere else now. So you have to just move on. And then there's, everybody has people in their life who just bring problems to them. You ha- you got to get rid of those people. You cannot allow other people's problems to become your problem. Mm-hmm. And I did that for a lot of times with employees where they had all kinds of drama with having kids out of side of relationships and garnishments and everything. And it was just draining me. I, I just like, I can't have these people in my life. Like I don't respect them, like not taking care of their kids and different stuff. So I, I just let that go. And and then the negative thought thing, like I don't watch the news and worry about inflation and worry about gas prices. I just focus on like what I can control. That's mm-hmm. making money. That's being happy. That's being a good dad. None of that, none of that stuff really matters to me. Yeah. Like people say are very worried about the president and everything. I, I've never had any president have any effect on my income personally. You say, oh, that's nonsense. You have. No, they haven't. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care if it's Trump or Biden. You can have a, a preference, but that's not the reason you're not successful. It's not. Stop it. Yeah. Doesn't well, have any effect on me. Like Mark says, control the controllables. I, I think of that yeah. a lot. Yeah. If you if you don't like some tax code, figure out legal ways to maneuver around it. Like and whatever it is, I only focus on stuff I can control. I do not worry about other the stuff. And uh, you know, like even even Josh, I used to watch when I was doing sparring and doing different stuff. Fifteen years ago, I used to watch YouTube videos of fights. I, I almost became obsessed watching those. Like, you know, on YouTube, like I used to sit there at like an hour at night and watch fights. You know why I liked it at first? Because I could see what was going to happen before. I'm like, oh, he's he needs to he's too close. He's too close. And and you'd see stuff. So it was interesting. But what happened was it started giving me a very negative feeling yeah. because I would I rem- I felt that and I had a girlfriend at the time and she knew I was doing a lot. I was always like shadow boxing in our house. She was like, what are you doing? Like, you're getting out of control. Like. She's like, I can feel it off you when we're out. I was getting very tense because you start thinking. So I said, hey, I'm still going to be aware of my situation, but let's face it, like nobody's attacked me yet. So it's unlikely it's going to happen in this convenience store in the middle of Pennsylvania. Relax. So anyway, if you you take in negative stuff all the time, it's going to become your reality. Yeah, my wife, ironically enough, last week, she says, you have an obsession with violence. Because I watch a lot of that stuff. I'm watching like John Wick, whatever. But I also, for Savage Syndicate, I search out a lot of violent stuff so I can talk about it, what people should and shouldn't do. And there's some websites that I am on that it it affects my emotions afterwards because there's some I won't even click on. If it says like, you know, beheading or cartel stuff, I'm like, okay, that's just violence. I don't need to see that. But afterwards, I'm like, and if I can't find something, I keep searching, I'm like, this is really making me sad and depressed. I'm, I got to move on to something else. And maybe I won't have that tutorial today, but it's like, it does change your attitude, your, your mental space. Right. And it's like, it's just, it does. A, yeah. So the number one thing I saw in there was I, it drives me nuts is it. People don't understand, like control the distance, control the damage. I cannot understand people getting in people's face. It, they get rocked so many times. 99 percent of the videos i watch it always goes wrong it, yeah. get out of people's face well we call it the monkey dance when you get up there oh f you f you and they're banging chest against each other it's like man one left yeah. hook and that guy's down but and I, I, butts up all kinds of stuff yeah, i do trained versus untrained videos and it's like you just watch that and you're like look look at how this guy's standing versus this guy look at like mm-hmm. there's so many cues like success leaves clues violence leaves clues too i mean it's yes. just amazing that people don't read them i know most of them are at a bar and intoxicated or whatever. They're not thinking straight, but it's like, why would you get in that person's space? 
when that's going to, you know, I mean, we can see it's going to happen. That's not going to end well. That's not, oh, and now you're knocked out cold. It's not. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I watch a lot of that stuff too, but uh, <laughs> giving uh, this idea that we will give back when we reach a certain income level or have a certain amount of time is a fallacy. I decided to do it when it was uncomfortable and will continue to do so. Well, you, I'll tell you what, you know, when, uh, so after, I guess I hadn't really given much in my, in my youth, when I was working, I didn't really think about it. And then when I, in like 2008 and I was kind of rebuilding and I had money problems and everything, I had this idea like, oh yeah, when I make a lot of money, I'll give, I'll give to that charity. You know, it could be something, somebody, a buddy of mine asking for $50 for some charity. And I would just think it was a lot of deal. The truth, and and I see it on social media comments where somebody's complaining about Oprah not giving a billion dollars or something to Hawaii. Like, why are you asking me for it? Like, before you worry about what other people are giving, you can give $5, you can give $10. So I started giving when it was uncomfortable. And I got it really from Mark is because what happens, sometimes you'll say in your mind, yeah, I'll give $1,000 to that. But then when you go to do it, you'll start talking yourself out of it. Like you say, well, maybe I'll just give 100. 1,000 is kind of crazy. And what I do now is I just give it. If I say it in my head, I'll just give it. So I've done some stuff with Mark and his things. Um, I'd like to do stuff for Christmas and, and stuff for families around here. And I just give it to them. And I never, I never miss it. And you could say, well, that's easy. You're probably making a lot of money. That's not the point. It's you got to just do it. And even if you give an uncomfortable amount for a millionaire, go ahead and do it. Uh, you'll, you'll never miss it. You'll never regret it. And it's, it's like a giving muscle. You got to do it. You got to just do it when you, when you don't have it. So if, if you say, well, I only have a thousand dollars to my name, you can give, you can give $25, mm -hmm. do it. $50, go ahead and do it. You'll get it back. It'll come right back to you anyway. It's just how it works. Yeah. That's always frustrating to me is when, you know, everybody has their thoughts on the Maui fire. They blasted Oprah and the rock like, Oh, yeah. they, they could solve the whole problem. If they gave all their money, it's like, well, that's not really, they're motivating you to do something right. Go out there. And yeah. Yeah. They're doing, they're giving plenty, but they're also using their influence to get more. Like, I'm, I was one of those people 30, 25 years ago. I'm like, why do these celebrities come on infomercials? Why don't they just cut the check? I, I didn't get it. They clearly, they're giving their time. They are, I know they're giving money and they're influencing others. It's, that's the massive thing. And that's kind of like the stuff, uh, you know, like the, the pull-up challenge. Mm -hmm. I had a friend of mine like, what are you giving a thousand dollars away to people? Like, what are you doing? And I said, it doesn't matter. It's like either you're giving it to somebody who's super motivated and I'll have a friend or some people gave it to different charities. It's like, it's win-win. Yeah. And I said, it, it'll just come back anyway. It comes back in a circle. It's how it works. Yeah. I, I, I've just seen it too many times. That's awesome. I love it. Um, gratitude, not taking things for granted like family. I absolutely had parent privilege. I have two incredible siblings as well. Blessed. Yeah. I mean, everybody talks about gratitude, but for me, it's, I don't want to say I took my family for granted. I lost my dad when I was 20 to brain cancer. I had an incredible dad. I have an incredible mom to this moment. My, my siblings are good. And when I, when I got to know so many people as adults, I saw that it was pretty rare that people had two great parents. They usually have one and then they have like kind of a not so great relationship with the other. It's just something I've watched. And some people don't have any. Like they have, maybe their father walked out on them and maybe their mom is, it's not that she's not a, a good person. They just, they just don't click. Right. And they, and I thought, wow, I got this like thing. And then I see siblings fighting and everything. And I think like, man, my, my brother and sister, they'll let go to war for me and I would for them. So I just really gratitude in general, but I call, I saw something on Instagram about parent privilege and that's when you have two great parents. And I thought, it's it's such an advantage in life to have great a great family behind you. You can do anything without that, so that's not an excuse. And that might say, well, we, it's easy for you to say, but I, I want to give that to my my family and my kids, and I'm I'm just really grateful of that. It, it makes it easier too when your parents pass on. So one thing I did with my dad, I was pissed off for a lot of years internally that I lost him, and then one day I just decided. 
after like five years of thinking about thinking about it, I said, maybe I should look at this like I had an incredible dad for 20 years, an incredible dad. Maybe I should just focus on that and not what I don't have. And it changed my whole perspective. What, it's better to have 20 years with a, a person that had massive impact on you than 60. And, you know, maybe they were just really nasty to you or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. How did you, you get know? to that conclusion to, 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 to I don't, change the way? You know, I had a lance. I used to cut grass. I had a landscaping business and it, it you, you spend a lot of time alone. You're basically just walking behind a mower all day and you're just thinking. And I was spending a lot of time thinking about that, my dad, and I was kind of pissed off about it. I would spend an hour a day basically for many years doing that. And then I just decided like, hey, this isn't really what I want to be doing is healthful. And I was thinking about my father dying of cancer and, and how that looked. And then I said, maybe I should worry about the, the 19 years when he didn't have it and all the great times. I just started focusing on that. And that that really just changed my perspective. And and right now, my mom is going through uh, cancer and everything, and hopefully she's going to be okay. But I really look at that perspective, too, is just be in the moment, enjoy all the great things with family. But that's everything. That's your friends. Be grateful for what you have. Too many people worry about what they don't have. I, I really focus on what I do have, and I'm going to double down on that. So that's why I create experiences and I bring my brother and my mom on vacations and I can do that. And I want to create all those experiences because we're not here forever. And I want to be grateful for what I have rather than I, you know, worrying about somebody has a, a cooler car than me or some, some nonsense. If you've dealt with Josh, death, Josh, and, and anybody in here knows when somebody close to you dies, you don't give a shit about 99% of the stuff you used to care about. It yeah. becomes minuscule. It's why not just live like that and say, hey, none of this stuff really matters. Let me focus on what matters. Just practicing gratitude and being grateful has, has been massive for me. That's that's great. My my mom's battled cancer five, six times. And it, it's just it makes me like any kind of petty things or just call her or FaceTime her every day. And just kind of, you know, it made me think of it right yeah. now. It's like, oh, I got to call my mom. Maybe I should make plans with her this weekend. It's like. There, I'm very fortunate. I have two great parents still alive, still together, married 50 years. Um, and we spend a lot of time. There's four of us, my immediate family, and we're very tight knit. So do you do you write down like like some people? I had one guy in the podcast. He says he writes down what he's grateful for, five things he's grateful for every day. Or is it just something that it, it's instilled in you and you don't need to write it down and think about it? It's just in there. I. I think about it. I don't necessarily write it down, but I, when I'm on my walks and stuff and I'm kind of just walking like right now, the, the leaves are really cool color. I'm just grateful for like being able to go for a walk and having this. And I think about all the things I'm grateful for. It, it really like gives me energy. Yeah. I like it. And, and if you ever do anything, a, a friend of mine just broke his, uh, broke his ankle and his leg on the other thing in, in a freak accident. He can't walk in anything. And he says, man, you take for granted just walking, just going to the bathroom. So it really is true. So I'm really just grateful that that I'm healthy and my family's healthy for the most part. Yeah, great. that's awesome. Uh, consistency and being curious to learn. This combination creates a win, not if, belief internally. Then you just show up and it will happen. Yeah, I like this. I tell this kind of the young guys and I just told a guy in my group this because I just see it in them. I said, it's not a question of if then it, it now it's when, because he's very curious. He does the work. And I said, all he has to do is stay consistent and it's if, and if, 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 if it's for him to build, buy these businesses and become a multimillionaire, it, it will happen. Too many people, they never get to that when state they just they just kind of like gloss over stuff they don't put the work in they're not consistent so to give another analogy for jujitsu if you go every if you go four days a week and you say i'm doing this for 10 years you you are going to have massive success in there and you have the right attitude you go in there you're prepared and then you're you're a good partner you train and you train hard it's inevitable that you're going to get really good at jujitsu but what happens is too many people aren't consistent. They just do things for like three weeks. You've seen people come through that class and they're gone. Mm -hmm. Like, what can you expect? So I know for, for my own success, because I've been doing this so long, 
it's like, I just put the work in. I just kept going over and over and over and I had bumps, but I never thought about quitting. So it was, I always knew like, I'll become a multimillionaire doing this. I just knew it, but I knew that it was going to be work and I was okay putting that work in. I just, that's kind of a thing to young people. They just, they, they want to like work for a year. It's that get rich, good, you know, everybody wants, Hey, okay, this works like this. I'll be a multimillionaire in two years. And then I don't really have to work hard. Right. This is easy. Right. Nah, it doesn't work like that. Mm-hmm. Like just be consistent. It's then it's a question of it, it's a, it's going to happen. It's when, not if it's going to happen, whatever you want in life. Yeah. So. That's great. Cause it's kind of like the, uh, how do you need an elephant because if you if you look at having a black belt uh, day one it's gonna take me 10 years to get this but if you just hey i'm gonna show up three tight three four days a week after week one after, then you look back at three years you're like holy crap i didn't that was three years ago and it, it it just because you were consistent you kept going you kept doing it you kept i mean i think that's huge i think that's a great lesson it's consistency will get you to where you need to go that's Most a skill in itself and so many people don't have it can you show up not when you're in the mood, but when you're not in the mood. Yeah. Can you do that? Can you go work out when you're like you're tired and you don't feel like doing it? When you if you if you become that person, it's it's just inevitable. Everything you want, you'll get. But too many people, they get in their feelings, they don't feel like doing it today. Hey, it's easier to quit and go eat a cho- piece of chocolate cake and have some beers. I don't want to work out today. And they the truth is they become consistently inconsistent. And that's that's what their life becomes. Well, I think that's what your challenges are so great because there, I wasn't thinking about doing 150 pull-ups at 5.30 in the morning, right? I, I have my normal workout, but that lit a fire under my ass and it made me do it. You know, and I, that's what the challenges are for me is like, hey, it's like, could I do them? Yeah, probably, but I wasn't going to do them anyway. But now that challenge lit the fire and I, I went out and did them. That's what I liked about the challenge. Well, there's a good example because to get to 150 pull-ups, you got to be consistent, like keep adding more and more, but then you probably have to do some other things, right? You got to lose some weight if you're heavy, because that's going to make it harder. But part of that was as I was getting older and I I used to lift weights and I used to lift heavy weights and, and it, it doesn't feel so good when you get in your forties and everything, your shoulders start to hurt. So I was doing a hundred pull-ups and I said, man, what if I just get this to 150 and I do that three times a week? I could probably do that like up until I'm 70 if I never skip. Yeah. And like, I know you're a 70 year old and doing that, like, because it feels good on my body when I do it. Now, I know you said you had the arm thing, but actually when I go overhand, sometimes it bothers my shoulder. So I do a lot like this. It feels very smooth, like cable like to me. And I just, I started to think like that, like, hey, I could probably do this for 20, 25 years. This is what I was thinking about five years ago. Now you're a 70 year old who's like really strong. I'd have to like everything for me to do that with it is what I want to be when I'm 75. So yeah, I'm going to just keep doing it. It's easy for me. I go for these walks every day and there's on this one place, there's a track and there's pull up machine. So a uh, pull up thing. I just knock them out there. It takes me about 22 minutes. That's great. That's, that's a little life hack too, is like making things like I eat healthier because my wife is very healthy plant-based and all this. And so it's like, I don't have the option to go down and eat a cheeseburger because it's just not available yeah. to, to, to me in my life. So don't make it available. Like that's the one thing I'm i I'm a little, like if there's ice cream around, I'll eat it. And I just try to not have it here, but I got kids and people put ice cream in there and I walk out there and the next thing I have two of them, but like, there's no way I was going to go to the store and go get an ice cream. Yeah. Well, so a- like you got to make it easy for yourself. So yeah, on the pull-up machine, I got one in my, I got one in my basement. I got one on my walk. I know where they are. So I make it easy for myself to succeed. Yeah. I know we're almost at it. We are at an hour. So this is the last one. Okay. Wanting more every day. This is a good thing, not a bad thing. I said the analogy in there, and this is what it is. Because when I was going into all these other states, I had somebody close to me and they say, man, why are you going in more states? Like almost like I was greedy. Like, don't, aren't you making enough? Why do you want more? You should chill, man. Like, just don't you want to just watch movies? Like, I don't know. It it was the stupidest conversation. So I told them, because he he used to play baseball with me. We grew up playing baseball. I said, when, and he was a good hitter. I said, when you were two for two and you had two home runs and you were going up for the third time, were you thinking about striking out or walking? Was that, should you chill? Should you maybe just pop out to the first baseman? Or were you trying to hit it in the woods again? And he said, I got it. Like, he got it right there. That's what, 
We all want to do. That's what drives me. It's not money. It's like, can I do more? I want to do more. Yeah. It's that's why I wake up. I'm ready to go. If if somebody just said, oh well, I mean, I could sell my business and sell things and like what? I'm gonna watch Netflix all day. By day two, I'd be yeah, I would be very miserable. I wouldn't want to do that. I want to like do more. So one of the things is I want to help more people in book car millionaires. So I do that. Then I like to keep my business going. I'm buying another, an, an, I bought two more businesses this year. I put partners in place. So it's not like I'm the guy doing every minute of it. I'm just doing Zoom calls like this. But I just want to do more. I want to hit home runs all the time. It's fun. That's I love okay. sports. I want I, I want to score. If, if I got 20 points at the half in a basketball game, I want to get 40. Up, I don't yeah. want to get 23. I don't want to get 23. Let's get 40. Yeah. And I think that's what the great thing about masterminds are is you're around people who think like that. Like, like my yeah. friends aren't in masterminds. And so when I drop these little nuggets, like, you know, dig a well before you need it. Huh? And I'm like, well, it's just those little nuggets that Mark and everybody yeah. like yourself are giving me that I'm, I love being around those like-minded people. And I think that's what, you know, that guy, when he was like, well, why do you, 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 you know, you, you, well, be, that, you already have a nice life. Just be subtle or ha be happy. No, he got, want, yeah, but, he got it when I said it, but he's not, that's just not his mindset. But yeah, if you're in these, these masterminds, nobody will ever tell you, why are you trying to do more, man? Why are you trying to buy more apartment units? Why are you trying to yeah. get better jujitsu? Nobody ever says that they're, they're with you. They're like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. And they push you to do more. And I, that's what I love about and it. And I like being around people like that. It's, that's fun for me. Yeah. Well, Kevin, I mean, I have a lot more to go, but I don't, I want to be respectful of your time. <laughs> um, if I just read through, this was, this was one social post you did your whole social media is, is nuggets like these. Like, uh, I have five things he can do to go from solopreneur to doubling his business facts. I, we won't go into that, but if you want more nuggets like this, follow Kevin, what is your social media? How do people find you? I go on Facebook. It's, it's Kevin Marin and there's only like two of us. So you'll see me. And, or you can go on, you can go on blue collar millionaire. I do posts in there as well. Uh, that's a Facebook group. Um, forget my Instagram, Kev GTR or something like that. But I, I like Facebook and I like doing those posts. I really like doing those posts because I just have an idea. I'll just pop, pump those things out and I get really good responses. People message me and it's just positive. I want guys and I'm not like, Hey, do this, do this. I just tell you what worked for me. And yeah. hopefully people can use that like these things and, and work Use what works for you. Discard what doesn't. Um, that's what I do in life. I try to follow people who've done things I want to do. I, I look at what works and what doesn't. I'm not looking at people who are talking about negative shit. It's not for me. And I think that's what resonates with me so well is like, you're not telling us like these posts aren't like, this is what you should do. This is like, hey, this is what I do. This is like those 10 things, yeah. are everything that you're doing and that are helping you and that, you know, little life hacks that you got on your own. Like, that's what I that's what I've gravitated towards. I'm not, I don't want the person who's yelling at me to do X, Y, Z, and they don't have the discipline to do it themselves. I, I know. Your social media is, is you. It, it, it's what you've done it's, to get where you're at. There's people who post, like maybe they're a vegetarian. They think everybody has to be that. Don't eat meat. You got to do this. Like, I don't even, like you didn't do it for the first 90% of your life. Why are you telling? Yeah. Like, I just tell people what worked for me. And then you can decide if you, if you think it would help you. Yeah, that's just genuine. That's how I try to talk to people. I'm not trying to tell them what to do. Yeah, do whatever you want to do. This worked for me. And I want people to, I just like helping people and maybe it speeds them up a little bit. I would love to go back 20 years, 30 years and tell myself a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. That's how I look at it. Like, hey, if I, I wouldn't even tell myself, do this, do this. I would just say, listen, this is what I'm doing if, in 2023. It works a lot better than this. It's up to you, bro. Yeah. What do you want to do here? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great way to end it. I love it. Talk, giving yourself <laughs> advice 20, 30 years ago. That's we, I, we all, I mean, I'm 48. Love, I, I would go back and I have a lot of things. I would, I, I, I mean, speaking of fitness, I always think, and I posted this the other day, could I beat my 20 year old self? And I think I could. I, I fight smarter. I'm, I'm better, obviously. I'm more strategic. And my old 20 year old self, they call me Shrek because I would just go in ah, and just fight crazy. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd take a lot of damage. But now, and so that's what I think of like, okay, what would I tell myself in business? What would I tell myself in relationships and all this other stuff? And I think about that a lot. So yeah, that's a great I, one. I think about that too. And 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 the answer is I can't, I couldn't do that to myself. I, I would lose to my 30-year-old self. But really? 
Yeah, I would because I was I was doing stuff back then. I was I loved wrestling and stuff like that, and I was I was I was very strong. Yeah. So that would be I would just think it would be a handful, and I and I was had more cardio and just stuff because I was I was playing basketball every night. So I, I can't compete with that. But uh, that was a problem with me, like the strength, because I, I have uh, files still from I, I track like how much weight I can lift ten times and different stuff. So sometimes I look and I'm like, wow, that was like a lot of weight. Yeah. And I can't, I'll never be able to do that again. That's why I had to have this pivot on, well, I'll just do things that don't make my body feel, but I'm still strong. So mm -hmm. I'm really just trying to be the best version of, of what I am today. But uh, awesome. maybe, I mean, if I started, if I started rolling five days a week, I'm sure I could choke myself out from back then. So. There you go. It wouldn't matter how strong technique beats. Nah, strength, I could, right? Yeah, you could do it then. I'm thinking that <laughs> because we talk about our son. My son's four. He's going to go into Gracie. They'll take you at six. He's so hyper now. It wouldn't work, but maybe by six he can do it. And I was thinking, I think I'll start doing it with him again. And like, why not? Well, that's because then he can. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if we do that over five years, now he's 11. We've been going three or four times a week. It's a cool bonding experience for us. It, I just, I know I'm going to do it on some level. I'm not going to be one of those parents sitting there looking at my phone. Like yeah. I got to get, because you know that your son, when he's doing it, he's listening. He knows you know how to do it. It's very different than my dad's 30 pounds overweight and he looks at my phone, his phone all the time. He doesn't know anything. He doesn't know what a camera yeah. is. He doesn't care. I, so I want to have that bonding experience with him. I have to be in shape because he loves football, surfing, and jujitsu. And so fortunately, I love them all too. So like we we go out and play pass and catch. We're running routes, jujitsu. Last night he was rolling, and I, the, his opponent he keeps looking at me, and he keeps looking at me like, "Was that a good move?" And even his opponent's like, "What are you looking at?" And I'm like, "Focus on <laughs> focus on the fight. Don't worry about me." Um, but then we surf together too. We're gonna go surfing after this. So yeah, if awesome. I if I had that beer belly and I couldn't do it, then I would be so hard on myself, and it's like I, I'd feel like a failure because. I have to keep up with that 10 year old. And I told him the other day, because he, he did something goofy to me. I said, you're never going to beat me, son. I'll be 80 years old rolling with you. And I'm going to kick, I'll, I'll check you out. Well, so that's my, that's my mental challenge to myself is to be able to always keep up with him. And one day he's going to smoke me. Me right? too. But they do what we do. They do what we do. I have a basement in the a gym in the basement. My son comes down there. He, he's work. He works out with me. He's lifts little weights. I got him little weights. He just like, you want, they want to do what your dad does. They want to do what dad does. Yeah. Yeah. So lead by what we, what we show them, not to what we tell them. You got to show them. I always say that show them. Don't, don't tell them. Well, thank you, Kevin. I really appreciate All it. Right. Um, I I mean, we just went through the 10. It was, it was gold nuggets right there, but I really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you for coming on. I appreciate um, it, Josh. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, everybody out there, stay safe, stay savage and stay hard to kill. Let's do it. What's up, Savages? Thank you guys so much for watching or listening to that podcast. I really appreciate it. If you guys want more information or more content like this, visit me at www.savagesyndicategroup.com where you could also join the Savage Syndicate group where I have over 160 videos in a library of all things teaching you guys how to become hard to kill. So again, I appreciate it. Thank you for the support. Stay safe, stay savage, stay hard to kill.